What's up guys and welcome back to Frontline Jizz. My name is Frey. If you're new here, welcome. Please hit the bell icon so you do not miss any video from me. And in today's video, as a matron or senior manager within the NHS, I've got some tips and hints and certain questions that are regularly asked within an NHS environment. I really hope this video will be so helpful to you and get you so many job offers on the way, all right? So stay tuned and get ready with your pens and paper so i know when people hear about interviews they begin to get all wary people actually become very anxious that they go in and then they just waffle on and everything that they had planned literally out of the window and they begin to talk about all types of things that they never even thought about so when you're going into an interview you need to structure your brain yeah structure everything you're going to say in bullet points or whichever way you revive try and remember some of the key things i'm going to talk about have scenarios ready in mind when you're asked to give a scenario interviewed so many people on all types of level from band two all the way to band seven and you know i have seen it all i've been to loads of interviews myself and every step or every rejection i've had in the past i've used it to better myself and nowadays i tend to do better interviews i think generally i've built my confidence with all the the feedback I've had from previous interviews where I've been rejected. Now let's ignore all the questions they'll ask you in an interview because right now there are two things okay. These two things are competencies and likability. Now because they brought you into an interview you either meet all or some of the competencies and they actually want to meet you face to face. The second part to win your hearts over and get that job offer is the likability aspect of things. Now a lot of people don't talk about likability. Maybe you know, three candidates all scored 30 out of 30. Now, who do we offer that job to? Who came across as very real, very open, very likable, that was smiling? Candidate that will be able to work across with all staff from various backgrounds without being annoying, without falling out with people. People that have got good sense of humor. I mean, people that you know clearly that when you put them on a ward, they'll be able to get along with a lot of people. They do not come across as stiff or very cold. Or... Because so many times I get people email me saying, I've been to about four interviews, I've had no offers. There must be a problem. You must be competent for them to invite you to an interview. Where are you going wrong? And I strongly believe that it's probably the likability aspect of things. They'll probably offer the job to somebody that they feel they'll blend well within that team and they'll probably get along with everybody else. I really hope that when you guys have interviews and things like that, you do politely ask for feedback. Let's go straight into this video. Let's start off question number one. This is usually the first question you're going to be asked in an NHS job role or any care facility. They'll probably ask you, tell us about yourself, your career to date and why you would like to work for this facility or with this hospital, with this care home. This is the question, but with three parts, okay? When they ask you to tell us about yourself, you need to not talk about your personal side by giving too much information. People will be talking about, hi, my name is so-and-so, I was born in 1984. You don't need to talk about your date of birth. You don't need to talk about whether you're married. I have always been skeptical about saying too much or putting too much of your personal information out there. For example, whether you're married or not married will not make any difference to your application. I, I personally think it's, it's not relevant to, for me to be sharing how many children I have for yourself. You can start off, oh, hi, my name is, let's say my name is Genevieve. I qualified as a nurse in 2003. I, I have worked in various departments such as this, that and that. I've worked in orthopedics, ED. However, in my current role, I currently work in general medicine for the last two years and I have worked my way up from being a staff nurse to a senior staff nurse within this space of time. Along those lines, I pursued continuous professional development. I've managed to do some courses in this and that and that, all right? And you can also go in and talk about some of the insights into the hospital trust or organization. Why would you want to work for us? You can say, I know that this facility is rated by CQC as outstanding or good. Hence, I want to be associated with a company with a good CQC report or results or whatever. And then you can also further carry on and say that I know the trust is well known for patient safety, for saving lives, world-class technology in this, that and the other, or if they are world-class in certain 
um, special to even talk about it you can say you have to give specific reasons why you have chosen this particular trust and you can say their values are in line with yours because it's you can begin to name the trust values for that particular company because they believe in kindness respect blah 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 and then you begin to put it all together and make it neat but if i'm offered this role i am going to commit to the values and this and that and this is how i would talk about the first bit because the first question is a is a deal breaker when you answer the first question right they are so open they will sit upright and because they want to see more from you they want to because they want to hear more from you and they believe that this person has got something to give us they will pay attention so you always have to nail the first question right if you have achieved certain things in your career or you know you receive any awards and things like that or if you're a champion for let's say tissue viability if you're a, a champion for certain specialties on your ward you can begin to talk about it all right and that's it so that's question number one question number two when would you adapt your communication style when caring for a distressed patient in your care so you need to be able to address the patient directly even if you, you know him or her has got ca um, cognitive capacity is diminished and um, you need to gain the person's attention sit in front of the patient or um, give them good eye contact you know you need to be able to communicate to their level if it's a child you need to go on your knees or give them you know eye level instead of talking down on them and the child is down here you are up here you know this is how i would look at this question okay so there's quite a lot of questions to go through so um you'll be able to you know keep the question and see how best you can answer it okay the next question is a scenario question you may be asked this is a drug error type of situation you are doing your 12 o'clock midday medications and you realize that the nurse on the night shift has administered a 6 a.m medication that the patient is allergic to what actions would you take now in this question the, the employer wants to know that you've got your head screwed on in terms of patient safety in terms of prioritizing in terms of following your a b c d e so i would think i would tell them that hey patient comes first patient is the priority patient safety is you know is paramount so i'll put the patient first i.e by i.e by assessing their patient you know doing their basic vital observation and checking their a b c d e preparing an antidote for medication that was given or getting the anaphylaxis kit ready because in some wards you can have anaphylaxis kits um, on top of having a crash trolley as well so you can get everything ready inform the doctor patient the manager um, report the incident you need to follow the doctor's orders you also need to be transparent and apologize um, apologize to the patient you need to also offer support to your co-workers because we're human and we can all make errors when i say support there's been instances where some nurses will tend to gang up against the nurse that made the error and they'll add more salt to the problem or more fire to the problem by telling the, um, the patient oh that no 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 don't talk about your your colleagues in a negative light in front of your patient you need to be very supportive yes by all means support the patient set boundaries okay you need to offer complaint slip in the uk we use a cut we use pals the patient liaison where people can make complaints and then that feedback will be followed through and managed accordingly and then finally you need to document so in this order if you explain to them that this is what roughly what you would do it gives a clear picture that you definitely will put patient first and then you worry about all the other processes later what actions would you take if you witness a colleague not demonstrating compassion care kindness and how would you escalate this concern so if a patient explained this behavior i will attend to the patient first always make the patient a first priority do not ignore the patient to answer all the other problems you go and talk to the patient make sure the patient is safe and you know well and you've listened to them first and then you begin to look at all the areas you need to tackle by speaking to your colleague by speaking to the manager you offer pals the complaints leaflet if the patient wants to be wants to make a complaint you need to document this behavior and you need to have a word with the colleague and offer them support and also convince them to go and apologize to this patient and then you take it you take it from there and listen to your manager on what direction you would take and if you forget anything you can always say you refer to um any document that's in place to support um, these type of um, behaviors 
for example this is unacceptable by the NMC it's unacceptable by the care commissioners we cannot behave like this compassion care and kindness is very important for and by you know the CQC by NMC we really need to be able to display this type of behavior and not vice versa question is I think this is question number four tell us the qualities that you possess that makes you a good member of a team so as a team member you need to be able to offer help you can't just sit around and say oh it's not my patient buzzing so i can't get involved you say i'll offer help um, and when you're offering help you're demonstrating empathy because you're your colleague is busy and you're offering help you will be an active listener you will communicate you communicate clearly um both said brother both written and verbal as a team player you need to be a problem solver you need to display positive attitude towards the team and commitment to the team and celebrate teammates success all right so when your um you receive some data about your ward and or if you work together on a very busy stressful shift and you all survived it you need to celebrate it and these are some of the things i will mention to answer this question five what do you perceive as the biggest challenge you might experience in this role and how you plan to address and overcome this so if you're coming from board and you've never lived in the uk before you would want to talk about things like the culture and adapting to the way of life in the uk you need to talk about the technology so if you're from um no disrespect but if you're from certain parts of the world um, maybe our software and our computing system is totally different from what you have back home and it doesn't mean that the UK is better than yours no by no means because when I worked in Saudi Arabia I saw certain equipments that were not even readily available in the UK on the NHS so yes yeah, some countries are for, you know some countries are even ahead than the UK you need to talk about preceptorship because you need to ask about some of the challenges of oh, I've got spelling problem there's a preceptorship I didn't spell it right apologies so preceptorship and um, who will hold your hand the first few months when you start working so these are some of the challenges you want to you want to talk about and that how you overcome them you overcome them through learning through asking questions you want to talk to your new colleagues you need to um, find out about the specialty the specialty that you may be offered a job in may be totally different from where you currently work back home how are you going to overcome that i will overcome that by um you know undertaking some online courses by being trained by the senior nurses that are already on the department by working with my practice development nurse and things like that this is how you overcome the problem so there's two things here what do you perceive they ask me what do you think will be the biggest challenge and then that's the second question will be how do you plan to address it everything i've mentioned here you should have a backup of how to you're going to address it if you were to be asked in an interview how do you demonstrate to patients and their relatives that you have listened to their wants needs and, and will act in their best interest at all times so for me to believe that you will take me serious basically i need to understand that you're demonstrating good communication skills you're listening to me when i say something taking note of it and you're acting on it listen to me and you don't act on it it means that you have no you do not have my best interest at heart so you need to demonstrate good communication skills you need to understand the importance of acting in the patient's best interest by being an advocate okay so if something's going on in the world you don't understand the patient can't advocate for themselves you the nurse as you are the advocate to demonstrate the ability to consider patient's preference for example if you have a jewish patient or a muslim patient or you have a particular patient that has got um that is not it's not a religious related thing but they have a special belief or certain things that they should have with them if it's a child they believe in having their special teddy bear with them on the ward it's question number seven you find yourself alone on the ward and you notice the patient is rapidly deteriorating how do you respond if a trust has got the escalation plan you know some people use the news the pews so you need to follow when somebody is you know um deteriorating you need to follow that pathway and respond i.e following your a b c d e you need to pull the buzzer you call out double two double two you need to get there when the assistant the assist team arrive you need to obviously offer them support and you know um delegate or whether you have to run around and help them to be able to sort this patient out and put them in a stabilized um you know department and then you know you need to notify the team if there's a staffing issues as well if any is going on number eight you have a patient who speaks no english the family has offered to translate what should you consider so 
I mean, there are three things, you know, interpreters should be neutral. You know, anybody that interprets for you should be, in, should be neutral because this is why it's best to use a professional interpreter instead of family. You know, you need to be able to give the example of some of the problems you have encountered using relatives to translate. Because when we talk about informed consent, if the patient is going to theatre, for example, they are getting their leg amputated, maybe the patient feel like, hey, I'm not telling my mom they're getting their leg chopped off. So they should just take her to theatre and bring her back. So you using an interpreter that is family will not be able to communicate things clearly to the family member who is the patient, you know. So it's best to use, you know, you know, a professional translator. Secondly, it may be appropriate in an emergency. In emergency, there's nobody around. You need to rely on the relatives. However, if you're doing things like informed consent and things like that, I would advise that you use somebody that is a professional. And thirdly, find out what the patient actually wants. You know, this is when informed consent comes in. Sometimes they don't want the family to interpret. They want somebody else. They don't want family to know what they are going through. You know, it's confidential. So I will tackle this question in this way. You've been assigned a new patient who has pressure sores. What do you need to consider and what actions do you need to take? You need to, first of all, you need to establish the pressure ulcer level and where it is. You've measured it, you've documented it, you've located where it is. You need to create a care plan, risk assessment. You need to talk about regular turning and dressings. You need to refer this patient to tissue viability nurse. You need to document and give example of some of the experiences you've had. Okay, this question says, you have informed the night doctor of your concerns with your patient, but he won't review your patient despite several escalations. What actions do you take? Now, I left this blank. So these actions is usually based on what your local policy says. So every trust has got their own local policies. But generally, generally speaking, if a junior doctor is not responding to you or maybe they're busy because, I mean, the NHS is very busy right now. So if somebody's not responding to you, you need to now look at the escalation plan. Who do I need to go to next? You should not ever, ever be frightened to approach the consultant because if the patient can deteriorate and you are scared to call the consultant, if the junior doctor is not getting back to you and you feel you still need help, there's so many people you can reach out to. You can inform your manager. You can inform the site team. You can inform um, the service manager. And then you can call the consultant yourself. It's better to be told off for wasting their time than to allow a patient to pass away because you were scared of the consultant. You shouldn't. You shouldn't have if that fearful culture. The consultant is a human being like you and I. You approach them in a professional manner and you tell them that this is a situation. I can't get hold of the junior doctor. This patient needs A, B, C, D. End of story. You've done your job and you document. Now, this question says, another, another member of staff has posted messages on social media related to a patient. What do you do? I will ask the patient, the colleague to take it down because of confidentiality. You would want to speak to the colleague. Their rationale for doing that is unacceptable. Remind them of the job that we do, the NMC, the hospital code of conduct, and then generally patient safety. You cannot be pushing the patient's information online. It's unacceptable and you need to report it as well. This question says you are rotated to work with someone you do not get along very well with. How do you handle the situation? This question, the employer is trying to find out whether you can prove that you can work along with people you do not get along with. Because in nursing, in customer service, anywhere there are human beings, you are bound to find people you do not get along with. Somebody will just show up and not like you for no reason or, you know, people will just don't want to see you. But you need to be able to overcome that. And by doing that, you're showing to the employer that you are able to, and you're flexible and you can work with anybody in any given situation okay and they want to prove that as long as you can get over your ego and put the patient first as the goal is the way forward you need to some of the things i'll talk about with this answer is that you would want to avoid triggers with the person that does not like you do they why do they not like you you know if there's something that you're talking about that's making them upset avoid that you need to show them that respect that, that you're your colleagues and try to look for things you both have in common instead of things that separates you that's what they want to hear from you and then if all else fails you can talk about reconciliation and where your manager can put you guys together and work a way of you both communicating your problems out this question says your patient wants to self-discharge against medical advice what actions do you take so first of all you want to try and convince them to stay try and explain why they have been admitted and try to establish what their concerns are and try to solve the problem 
if they do not understand why they're here you need to now use other forms of communication to help them to understand if that fails and they are you know well informed and they are very certain and adamant that they want to leave you would want to inform the doctor on call you need to uh, follow the doctor's orders and advise them accordingly also you you also you will advise them to sign the ama and you, you need to advise them to come to a and e if their condition deteriorates or go to their gp and secondly you need to be able to get the doctor to see them hopefully before they leave and then they need to document that um they are they are being discharged basically this question says tell us about a time you made a drug error or a mistake at work and how did you resolve this now you need to give a very simple confidential scenario and um, what steps you took what you learned from within your reflection and how you can be a better practitioner do not talk about anything complicated that will get you tangled up keep it simple talk about each of the steps that you took and um, the safety aspect the quality side of things your reporting and everything that you did to be able to you know um, be a better practitioner so that this incident doesn't happen again tell us about a conflict you have experienced at work and the steps you took to resolve it first of all always keep your scenarios very simple okay i'd want to talk about you know when it comes to conflict you need to assess the situation understand the situation address the conflict promptly do not wait two weeks later to talk about it reach out to the other party you need to state your concerns clearly and calmly focus on the issue rather than the person involved and listen with an open mind collaborate through dialogue follow up with others if needed and prevent future conflicts that's how i would deal with a, you know a conflict um, resolution steps what is safeguarding and give an example of when you encountered a safeguarding concern with a patient you explain this is my little explanation safeguarding refers to the processes practice and culture embedded within an organization to create a safe environment where children young people and adults um, are at, who are at risk are free from all forms of harm abuse or neglect so this is where you give a simple example if you've seen any at work and then explain what are some of the things that you did you know to help overcome some of the safeguarding issues this question is a scenario one your shift just ended however as you are about to leave you are informed that a nurse called in sick last minute what would you do now there this is a value-based question they want to test your values so i would talk about how i would probably wait and help out or do a twilight and get my manager to push my hours back if i'm working the next day or swap my shift or because this answer they want to know that you want to obviously help the department so you want to talk about helping out and um, um, doing a twilight shift or um, asking for a day off tomorrow if you stay on or um, you know are you getting an extra pay um, you're happy to support the department until the site team or the night doctor or whoever is on call is able to find somebody to replace um, you know to help with staffing before you leave the department you're asked by a doctor to administer a drug you're not familiar with. What would your actions be? Now, you want to read in the um, BNF or the Trust Drug Information Science. Some places it's called the Medusa. Um, you need to look at medicine management policy within your trust. You need to understand what the drug is used for. Every single drug you give, you need to understand what it's used for. You need to speak to your ward pharmacist for further clarification. You need to read up on the NICE guidelines. Uh, or you can go up to Google and find that out and find out what the possible side effects are and which antidotes are for the prescribed drug. You need to describe a time when you had to manage lots of different tasks at once. So this one, you need to give an example of working under pressure. They want to know how you, you cope under pressure and how you prioritize your patient care. Tell me a time when you dealt with a challenging or stressful situation at work. So this scenario, I left this simple. You need to give a simple scenario. I always say simple because do not complicate things, all right? Keep it very simple so that they, they fall in love with whatever example you give them. The employer wants to know how you cope with stress. And that's the end of the little interview. I hope this has been helpful. Um, so let me know what next video you want me to do. But yes, um, that's the end of the interview regular interview questions that you may be asked in an you know care setting situation all right thank you take care bye